Okay, so we're going to be looking at a paper three from May 2021. Right. So the first question here, I'm not going to read through the whole thing. I've put a link uh, in the descriptions here that you can download the paper. And so what I recommend is you, you could probably just print it. It's only a few pages. Have that side by side so you've got that in front of you or in a separate tab. Um, basically, what's uh, going on in number one is uh, analyzing this cubic function. Okay, so let's, let's get into it. Okay, so question one. We're going to investigate a cubic function. There it is, x cubed minus 3cx plus d. And we want to analyze this as far as what happens when these parameters c and d change. Okay, So here's uh, as c changes, this is how it, the function changes. You notice that the, the y-intercept is fixed. All right. And so they're going to start us off with um, showing some graphs as C changes. So they give us two, and you're going to produce two. And this is, I think, the intention is to build up a little in intuition as far as what happens to the function as C changes. So first thing, let's get the y-intercept. That's fixed, so we can put that in. So we've just put zero in to the function and we calculate it. We get the y value of two. So the y-intercept is zero, two. All right, so they give us uh, two, two graphs. This is when c is negative one. Notice uh, what we're going to be looking at a lot here is the x-intercept. Sometimes I'll use the word root. So this has only one root, okay? It has no turning points. Uh, second one they give us, c equals zero. This one also has only one root, um, and it appears to have a gradient of zero when x is zero. So we'll also get into that later. Now you have to produce uh, two graphs. You need, need to sketch these. So you just put it in your calculator. And first one is c equals 1. So the function is x cubed minus 3x plus 2. And you have to label these critical points. So we have the y-intercept already. And you got a calculator, so you don't even have to go through uh, you don't have to set the first derivative to zero and s solve for x and then put that into the function. You can just get the minimum and the maximum from the calculator. So make sure you're good with that calculator. All right, so there's the first one and your three points that you need to label. All right, next one. C equals 2. All right, so the function is x cubed minus 6x plus 2. And you get your min and max from the calculator. Label them to three significant figures. All right, so that's part A. Part B, now you need to get the first derivative. And that's a, it's an easy function to get the derivative. So we'll tuck that away in the corner. And that'll help us analyze a little bit more here. So that's part B. All right. So there, there it is on the graph now. I've added the derivative. All right. I guess a couple things to notice here now. I've marked the max with a blue dot 
and you notice that the derivative crosses the x-axis at that same x value. So the derivative is zero there. <clears throat> same with the, the minimum, which is the red point. And you see that the derivative crosses zero at that same x value. All right. Now, as you're going through your exam, you're probably not going to draw the derivative. I understand that, but it's good to have a picture. At least you know it's a quadratic, right? And you, so you think about two roots and this kind of thing. All right. So we go on to C. First thing is to get the point of inflection. So that's going to use the second derivative. And the point of inflection is when the second derivative is equal to zero. Second derivative is 6x. Only zero when x is zero. And then, <coughs> excuse me, we need the, um, the c. What is the c value? What is a value of c when the point of inflection also has a gradient of zero? So we're going to have to look at the first derivative. And so x is zero. You put that into the first derivative. And how does the first derivative become zero? Only if c is also zero. Okay, so there's the point, and the other condition is that it has zero gradient. So that's when the first derivative is zero. So that's at c equals zero. That's the point there. All right. Okay. For the rest of c, for the rest of c now, we're gonna set the first derivative to zero. And we're going to solve this quadratic in terms of C. All right. So this is a nice, easy quadratic. You can just uh, add C to both sides. You can divide by 3. They're gone. We take the square root of both sides. Yep. And so x is equal to plus or minus the square root of c. Okay, so this quadratic, the first derivative, has real solutions only when c is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, we already looked at the case of zero. Okay, that's the point of inflection with zero gradient. Okay, now we're looking at c2 and we want to know when it has one minimum and one maximum. That's when the derivative, first derivative, which is a quadratic, it's when that has two solutions. Okay, so that means that C <clears throat> is greater than or equal to zero. Um, also, We'll talk about C3 now. Um, okay. So it has no gradient of zero. That means no solutions to the quadratic. That means C is negative. That means no real solutions to that quadratic. Okay. So in summary, let's just look at C. So uh, C1 is when C is zero. And C2 is when C is greater than zero. It has so two roots for the uh, first derivative. Okay, so it's going to have a max and a min. Yeah, or if you look at the derivative, it's when that is below the x-axis and crosses the x-axis twice. And then uh, has this is where it has no roots, C3, and that's... Uh, when c is less than zero. Okay, so hopefully the, the graphs and all those things help you get some intuition there, and it's the, the algebra is pretty simple. All right, now for d, we want to find the y value of the max and the min. Okay, so let's look at the max first. So we know that um, at the, so, the solutions for the for the first derivative that we just found, plus minus square root of three, square root of c. That's that's what will give us two 
two critical points, let's say. Okay. So the maximum is the left side of the graph. That's when the answer is negative square root of C. So we're pointing at that. So the left side of the cubic. Okay, so then all we need to do is put that value into the function and calculate. And not a bad calculation. We end up with positive 2c to the 3 halves plus 2. Okay, notice that the 2 is the d value. All right. Likewise, the minimum is the right side of the graph, pointed there in red. And we put the, so it's, that's the plus square root of c. Put that into the function. Okay. Yeah, not too bad. The algebra's okay here. So we end up with negative 2c to the 3 halves plus 2. So that's part D. Okay, so to summarize part D, we've found the y values for the max and the min. I've also put in here in green the max and the min, okay, when D, in general, let's say, the general case, so for any D. So for any D, it's going to look like that. That'll be useful later. Okay. So on to E. We want to find the the set of C values for these three different cases, one root, two root, three roots. Okay. Or as they're saying, when it crosses the X axis. Okay. So when does it have one root? It has one root when Y the minimum, okay, so that's the red point, when that is above the x-axis, okay, so when that's positive. See, it has only one, it only crosses the x-axis at one place. Okay, so we can take what we just got from part D. We found the y value, right? So that's negative 2, c to the 3 halves plus 2, that's the... That's the minimum. We want that to be bigger than zero, okay, above the x-axis, in other words. And then we just solve this inequality. Okay, remember when you, when you we're going to divide by negative 2, so when you divide by a negative, the inequality sign switches. Okay, and c is less than 1. In the question, it also says c should be bigger than zero. So that they just put that in there. So, okay, that's fine. So the C is uh, greater than zero, less than one. So that's one root. Okay. When the local minimum is equal to zero. Okay, so that's when it's touching the x-axis. So the Minimum is touching the x-axis. This has two roots. Okay. So then we just put in the minimum there, set it equal to zero, solve for C. Okay, so C is equal to one. So when C is one, and this is one of the graphs uh, that you made. So there's that. And then finally, when will it have three roots? It'll have three roots when the minimum is below the x-axis. 
So the red dot, the minimum, is below the x-axis. That shows us now that the function crosses the x-axis three times. And so just same process. You put in that y value that we got in d, and it's less than 0. Again, we're going to divide by negative 2, so we flip the sign. And we end up with C greater than 1. All right. So that's part E, and we're pretty much done. We have one more thing to do. And what we'll do is look at when the, what happens when D changes a little bit. Okay, so back to our function. Here is as... C changes, okay, so we should have a good idea about that right now, what happens when C changes. Notice the roots, how many roots, yeah, one root there. I'll throw in the derivative, all right. You see uh, the, when the derivative is above the x-axis, that means no min, max or mins. Here it's below, yeah. Now D, as we change D, D is just a vertical shift up or down. All right, so C determines the shape of it and D, the position, basically. All right, now, so in general, we want to know uh, when will this thing have only one solution? Or when will it have only one root? When will it cross the x-axis only one time? Okay, there are two different... Um, there are two basic cases that we're going to look at separately. So first of all, if C is less than or equal to zero, okay? So remember, if C is less than or equal to zero, uh, it has no local minimum or maximum. Okay, so it looks kind of like that. That's uh, when C is negative one. So if C is less than zero, obviously it can only cross one time. It has no turning points. Okay. So in terms of the first derivative, um, the first derivative is always above the x-axis. It's always positive. Okay. When is it positive? Only when c is less than or equal to zero. Okay. Case number two is when c is bigger than zero. That's when you will have um, a max and a min. Okay, so now let's think about this. When can we have only one root for the cubic function? Okay, well, if the minimum is above the x-axis, then it crosses only across the x-axis only one time. Okay. So if the minimum should say local minimum there, if that's bigger than zero, then it has only one root. All right. So we're going to use the, the general case now for any D. So we need, we, we need to describe the conditions for D in terms of C because they're related. So we put in the general case for the minimum value, and then we just uh, simplify this a bit. It's not clear how far you need to go with simplifying, but I think that should be fine. So basically, if 2 times c to the 3 halves is less than d, you're going to have one solution. Or if the maximum there, if it's below the x-axis, okay, if the maximum is below the x-axis, less than 0, also you'll have one solution or one root. And then we just, you put in the max, the general um, 
case for the maximum value of y, that's the 2 times c to the 3 halves plus d. Set that less than 0 and simplify a bit. And there you have it. All right. Okay, so there's a summary of the cases when you'll have only one root or only one crossing of the x-axis. And that's all for question one. Question one, a good investigation into a cubic function and looking at how these parameters change the shape and the position of it. And to prepare for these types of questions, I would recommend Desmos. I think I said that before. You can play around on that a lot with um, changing of parameters. You add a slider in it and you can see what happens. And so you build in a little intuition. You have to also be rigorous when you're finding points and proving things, but the intuition also is useful and helpful. Okay, onward to number two. Okay, so now on to question two. Um, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but it would be good if you have it. There's a link again in the, in the description so you can get the paper there and have it somewhere on paper or on a screen so you can follow along. Um, yeah. Okay, so there it is. And let's, uh, let's get started. All right, on to question two now. We're going to investigate regular polygons and the special case when the area is equal to the perimeter. All right, so as is usually the case with question uh, paper threes, they start you off with specific cases, simple cases. You build a little intuition and usually the goal is to is to generalize. All right, so we start with the square. That's the one of the most simple regular polygons. Um, and the area is equal to the perimeter, and we need to find out the value of, of s. All right, so all we do is we write down the area of a square, s squared, and that's equal to the perimeter, 4 times s, and we just solve for s. All right, we can divide out an s because we know s is not 0. And we get s equals 4. So that's a nice way to start. s is 4. All right, so before we go too much further, let's just look at how the area and the perimeter are related. That's going to be what we're looking at here. Okay, so as the as the uh, side increases with this square, okay, you notice that the area exceeds the perimeter, and then as it goes, as it gets smaller, okay, there's when it's equal, it gets smaller, the perimeter exceeds the area. Okay, so there's a sweet spot somewhere there where they're equal. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. Now we look at regular polygons. Let's run through a few examples. And you notice here that I've put the, the isosceles triangle. So any regular polygon you can cut into isosceles triangles. And there are as many triangles as there are sides. All right, it's six sides, seven. Okay, we can stop. We don't have to keep going. And then so we could also say that if we analyze one particular isosceles triangle, we can learn a lot about the polygon. So... Mm, We'll stop here at eight, I think. Okay, let's stop here. So we've pulled out 
one of those isosceles triangles. And my point in showing you these different polygons is that we could keep going and we can um, generalize. Okay, I stopped at eight just so we have a real example. But I'm, I'm now generalizing by saying that the angle is two pi over n. So this is for any number of sides. Okay, we're calling the the uh, the base there y. That's also the edge of the one of the edges of the polygon, and the uh, and the the two equal sides are x. All right. So any polygon can be thought of as a uh, n number of triangles. All right. So now uh, we need to uh, we need to an expression for the area of one of these triangles. Okay, since we have that one angle on the two sides, the adjacent sides, hopefully you it clicks with you and you say, okay, I'm going to use the sine um, area of the triangle formula. It's set up perfectly for that. So the x's go there, the angle goes there, and that's it. Part B done. All right. There are other ways to do it, by the way, but that one is by far the, the easiest. OK, now I'm going to cut that triangle in half. And that's over there now, the red one on the left. So you notice that the angle is cut in half, and the base is cut in half. And the x is still there. It's a right triangle. All right, and so now what I need to do is get an expression for y. Okay, so we can use the sine ratio. Sine of the angle is opposite over hypotenuse. So that's there. And we multiply by 2x, and that gives us an expression for y. All right, moving along. This is not so bad. Okay, and then... We are going to, um, let's first, okay, let's put the those pieces that we found, because we'll use those. Okay, and now, so we're setting uh, the perimeter equal to the area. And when does this happen? So hmm, they're telling us, they're giving us the target, right? And so we just have to, we just have to get there with algebra, okay? So let's write down what is the perimeter. So the perimeter is n sides times y. That's the that's the edge of the polygon, which was also the base of the triangle. And then n times the area of, the, of each triangle. That's the area of the total. All right. So we throw in y and we throw in the area. Those are the two things that we just found. Typical of uh, IB paper, especially paper three, uh, you find you get a result in one part of the question and you use that for the next part. Okay, we have a common factor there of n. We can throw that out. Okay, what else can we do? You notice here we have sine pi over n on one on the left side and sine 2 pi over n on the right side, those don't really mix very nicely. And so hopefully you get the idea of using the double angle formula. So that's what we'll do with on the right side. Double angle formula is there. Now we've got all the angles are the same, all pi over n. What can we do with that? Well, let's subtract the left side. So we have everything on one side. And then you got to pull some algebra magic here. And we look for a common factor. There's an x sine pi over, two, pi over n in both of those. So we can pull that out. And let's see what that does for us. 
Okay. So that's nice because the first factor, the x sine pi over n, we can divide by that. We can basically throw it out because we know it's not zero. Well, we let's see. We know it's not zero. That's a good question. Okay, I was just thinking we can divide by the x sine pi over n because we know we know it's not zero. The x, of course, can't be zero because it's the side of a triangle. On the sine piece, so as n gets really big, that approaches zero, and so hmm, it's a little bit more complicated. But we're going to get into that situation where n approaches infinity later. So let's leave that. So we can we can divide by that first factor. We can throw it out, and we can say that the only way to make this thing equal to zero is if the second factor is zero. Okay. So now we just solve this for x. We add two. And then we divide by cosine pi over n, and that's x. So let's stash that over there for future use. All right. Uh, now, let's see, we have um, all these expressions um, on the left side in green. We still have to reach our target. I suppose you could use the area, um, but I'm using the perimeter. We want to make the, we want to show that this is equal to 4n tangent of pi over n. Try the area. Maybe that'll work. I didn't try that. Okay, so anyway, um, we throw in our um, expression for y, and we throw in our expression for x. Okay, you can see already, right? This is going to make it. This is going to give us what we want. Okay, so all that stuff is 4n. Then we get sine over cosine, and that gives us the target. Okay, so the perimeter was pretty easy. Probably easier than using the area. Okay, next uh, up is E. We're going to use uh, McLaren. Don't be intimidated by that name. It's not, it's, uh, shouldn't be intimidating. We're just, we're, we're given this thing. Okay. So McLaurin ex expansion of tangent X. And then we have, uh, as our angle pi over N and all we need to do is take what they gave us and substitute in pi over N everywhere you see x. So that's all those red pieces. Okay. So we have an expression for tangent of pi over n. And then we're going to use that to find the limit as n approaches infinity of our expression for the area or the perimeter. So the 4n tangent pi over n. All right. So wherever, so let's see, where you see the tangent pi over n, we're going to throw in that expansion. Boom. All right. Um, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the ends in the denominator. All right. And then we just distribute that n throughout the bracket. So for the first term, the ends cancel, so we just have pi. The ends are reduced in the other ones. All right. Now we can we can do this limit because we have uh, ends in the denominator. So the first piece is just pi. I'm looking at the parentheses now. The first piece is just pi because it's not dependent on n. 
The next piece is zero because you have n squared in the denominator. And the next piece is also zero because you have n to the power four. n's going to infinity. So we're left with this, four pi. Right. So as n approaches infinity, the area and the perimeter are both equal to four pi. Geometrically speaking, what does that what does that mean? This is a one one mark, and it's the kind of the neat um, result that that they want you to look at, that they want you to see. Right? This is this is what makes them so happy about this this problem. Um, they're gonna see that it's a circle. Okay. So anyway, I'm gonna just show you what happens as n gets really big. Right? It already looks like a circle. We don't need to go much. We don't need to go to infinity, <laughs> but there it is. Okay, as n approaches infinity, that thing becomes a circle, right? And in fact, a circle with area four pi and perimeter four pi, which means uh, it approaches a circle with a radius of two. Okay, this is related to the square too, isn't it? Like. 2 squared is equal to, uh, no, forget that. <laughs> All right, but anyway, that's, uh, yeah, that's what it is. It approaches a circle with radius of 2. Pretty cool. Finally, this is kind of from left field. Still area equals perimeter, but a totally different thing. It's not a regular polygon. It's a right triangle. I guess they just needed to add some extra marks. Okay, so there's the perimeter. That's the three sides added together. There's the area. And they're equal. All right. So now you, you're, I'm going to just send like a boatload of equations. All right. So buckle up. Try to do it yourself, I would say. I don't know how much it helps to watch someone else, or especially a machine, do algebra. Um, I'll try to point out some little things here. Okay, we're just subtracting A and B from both sides. And basically, what I, my idea was to isolate that square root sign so that I'm, I can square everything. So that's what I did on the sec second thing here. I square both sides. Now I wrote the right side at, with the two factors next to each other so that you can just look at the expansion. Um, there's nothing hard about expanding these brackets, but it is very easy to make a mistake because there's so many, so many things you got to make sure you get. You basically have three terms times three terms. So you know you're going to end up with nine terms. So one thing to do is to count your terms when you're done. Make sure you have nine. You got to be careful of the signs and all that stuff. So this is the place, especially if you're running out of time. It's easy to make mistakes here. So the more you, the more you practice, you get the, the muscle memory in your writing hand. I think it's, uh, it's important actually. Um, but yeah, you gotta be a little careful on this. Here's the expansion, all nine terms. Boom. That's using the first one and then the second one. Okay. So that's, uh, I made mistakes the first time I did this. All right, so there you have it. That's the expansion. Notice those pink terms, those will, those you can throw out, right? So that's nice. You got a squared and b squared on both sides, so they fly away. And then, so you got zero, and then we're gonna combine the like terms. Let's just be careful. Okay, now we have a four in the denominator. 
I'd like to get rid of that, so I'll just multiply everything by four. All right, now what? It seems like we should do some factorizing. And what exactly do you factorize here? Hmm. It's possible that you go down the wrong path here and then turn back and try something else. This is what turns out to work. If you take an A, A, B out of everything, now you got those two factors. And that's nice because we can throw out the A, B. Why can we throw that out? Because we know it's not zero, right? They're the lengths of the triangle. So the only way to make zero is with the right factor being zero. So we throw that out. Now we have this left. Okay, what can we do here? Well, let's move the those terms to the left and we have uh, everything with A left on the right. Okay, we can factor that A out and we're looking good now. We've isolated A. Beautiful. Now we just subtract, uh, no, divide b minus 4. Okay. And there is an expression for a, but it's not exactly the target. So you've got a little more work to do. And we need to figure out how to get to the, the target that they gave us. So it's a little, it's a little tricky here how to do that. If I, instead of minus 8, I write minus 16 plus 8, that's minus 8, okay? So it's still the same. This is going to allow us now to basically hit the target that they gave us. All right, so you really have to look at what it is um, or what the form is that they want you to produce, okay? By having that minus 16 now, that allows us to take the first two bits of the numerator and factorize that. And then you can split that into two fractions. We get four with, with that and yeah, eight or B minus four. And that's what they want you to produce. Okay. Now for the final bit. In the orange box, uh, I, these are some things that we know about A. All right. They also tell us that A, B, the area, and the perimeter are all integers. Okay. So no fractions involved. No decimals, no fractions, all integers. All right. Now, if that's the case, since a is an integer, and a is 4 plus 8 over b minus 4, 8 over b minus 4 also must be an integer because you're adding it to 4. So if it's, a, if it's not an integer, then a wouldn't be an integer. So it has to be an integer. Okay. From there, we can just count, really, all the possible values of b that would produce an integer there. So if b is 5, you have 8 over 1. If b is 6, you have 8 over 2. Okay, that's that fraction above, uh, and, and so on. So b can only be those four possibilities. And from here, they also told us that there's only two triangles. Well, let's, we'll talk about that in a bit. The other thing is that the hypotenuse is also an integer because the perimeter is an integer. So A and B are integers. You add the hypotenuse, that also must be an integer. And so basically what that means is that we are dealing only with Pythagorean triples. So that means uh, with the right triangle, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, all those are integers. Okay. And hopefully you are aware of some, um, you know, the first few examples of Pythagorean triples. Three, four, five is the is 
the first one you probably realize, right? And then if you scale that up, six, eight, ten, okay. And then there's a, there's a few others that you probably know. If you know those, that's good. That's helpful. All right. So all we're going to do, we only have four Bs to check, so we're just going to check them one by one. So we put uh, B is five. You get the value of twelve for A, and lo and behold, that is a Pythagorean triple because five squared is 25 plus 12 squared is 144. So that's 169. Square root of 169 is 13. That's an integer. So there you go. Triangle one. That is a Pythagorean triple. 12, 5, and 13. So we have to give the perimeter and the area. It's quite easy. Just add them all up. We get 30. Okay. Need to find one more. This is where you're happy. There's only one minute left. And you find this one also. Oh, that's so sweet. Pythagorean triple. So 6, 8, and 10. Okay, and then you write down quickly the area and the perimeter. Just 24. All right, and that is the journey of question two done. All right, hope you enjoyed that. Hope it helped you. Let me know if you have any comments. And see you next time.